Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now, it's good to see you here in the house of the Lord today. We appreciate your presence. Always good to meet in God's house on the Lord today. We're glad to see you here at Northside. We have some visitors, and we appreciate you paying us a visit today. Now, you that's listening out in the radio listen audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to Northside Baptist Church Hour. That's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the hour coming up, we can be an inspiration to you in song as well as a message from God's Word. Now, if you have your Bible, you turn to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. I begin reading with verse 45. Now, the cassette tape today, in which the singing. And the message will be on, it'll be tape number 171. If you'd like to have this cassette tape, just write in and say, Preach Edward, send me tape number 171, or tape on the seven last sins of Jesus on the cross. We have about 168 tapes listed here. If you'd like to have a list of our cassette tape, just write in and say, Preacher Edwards, send me a list of your tape. We send these out for a gift of $3.00. For each tape and a gift is yours to help pay the radio expense. We just returned on yesterday from a 10-day tour in the Holy Land. I brought back with me some beautiful Bible markers. I only have a limited supply. If you'd like to have one of these beautiful Holy Land Bible markers, you write in and enclose a gift to be used to help defray the radio expense and request it. We'll send you the beautiful Bible marker. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. I hope you're finding the place now in Matthew chapter 27. Next Sunday, of course, is Easter. Today we're talking about the seven last sins of Jesus on the cross. Next Sunday we'll be bringing a message pertaining to the resurrection. I hope you'll be present. As a preacher introducing his wife to a group of other ministers and their wives the other day, the preacher's wife weighed about 250 pounds. He said to him, after he introduced his wife, he said, when we got married, my wife only weighed 118 pounds. He said, of course, she's filled out some since then. And so, you always can be filling out, you know, in more ways than one. I hope that you will fill out spiritually as you get the word of God. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness of all the land unto the ninth hour. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabbathani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard this said, This man called for Elias, that is Elijah. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. And the rest said, Let it be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. And when he had cried with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. Now that's as far as I'm reading today. I want to speak on the last seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. The Lord willing, I'll spend the entire week next week on the broadcast talking about these last seven sayings. And you can get the program at 12 o'clock noon each day on the station where you're now listening. That's WNGC, the big giant station here in Athens, Georgia. If you're not getting that daily broadcast, I hope you tune in and get it on tomorrow at noon. Now there's seven words our Lord uttered on the cross. A few days ago, once again, I stood there at the foot of Mount Calvary and looked upon that little mountain there where our Savior died, there the place of a skull. Right there nearby is a tomb where they buried our dear Lord in a beautiful garden. This garden is filled with beautiful flowers. We served the Lord's Supper while there, sang some hymns, visited the garden tomb, and you can feel the very presence of God in that place. As much weeping, much praising God. There were other groups there. Now you can always feel the presence of God around Mount Calvary and around the garden tomb. In preparing for our tour for the first 
few months of our preparation, I told the people that it's a trip of a lifetime. And they said to me, on the way back, said, Preach Edwards, you told us the truth. It's a real trip of a lifetime. Wouldn't take anything in the world for it. And so it was very beautiful and very gracious and a wonderful trip. We come to word number one, and that's the word of forgiveness. As Jesus hang on the cross, he offered up the word of forgiveness. And you find in Luke chapter 23 and verse 34, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Here we find the Son of God asking the Father to forgive those people that were crucifying him because he said they don't know what they're doing. They were in spiritual darkness, led astray by their religious leaders, and they didn't realize they were putting to death God's only begotten Son, the Messiah. And he said, now they don't know what to do. Here we see Christ's love for his people. He loved them right on to the end and asked God for forgiveness for them. Here we see the blindness of the human heart. He said they don't know what they're doing. The reason you have so many people today out in sin, living like the devil, on dope, on whiskey, on alcohol, is they're blinded. They don't realize what they're doing. I heard on the news this morning some five people killed in automobile accidents around the vicinity of Athens, Georgia, this weekend already. And most of them are young people. They are killing themselves on the highways. Many of them cross the a center line and meet somebody head on. Why do they cross that center line? They are drunk. They are drunk on alcohol or their own dope. And today, many, many cars you'll meet on your way home if you take a journey. Under that steering wheel will be a driver that's half drunk or completely drunk or on dope. And your life is in jeopardy now every time you drive down the highway because of this very thing. Amen. People are blinded, blinded and led down the broad road to destruction. Here we see man's great primary need and that is forgiveness. Man needs to be forgiven and needs to be pardoned from his sins. And the only way you'll find that is in Christ Jesus. That's word number one, the word of forgiveness. That brings us to word number two said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shall thou be with me in paradise. Now you know the story here, how the two thieves died on the cross, one on one side of Jesus and one on the other. One thief died and went to hell that very moment. The other thief died and went to paradise with Jesus. There God offered him the word of salvation. He believed and he accepted the Lord, and Jesus said, Today shall thou be with me in paradise. And that very moment, that very minute that he died with Jesus, they went down into paradise together. Paradise in those days was down in the heart of the earth. And Jesus went with this thief to paradise. Down there, there were two compartments, one called Abraham's bosom. The other place where Dives, a rich man, went a place called hell, and so Jesus went with this one into paradise. Here we see a representative sinner. This man represents all sinners and lets us know that a man can be saved if he'll repent and trust Jesus Christ. Here we see a man had come to the end of himself before he can be saved. How true that is in the lives of sinners. You'll never get a sinner saved until you get him lost, get him to the end of himself. This world today is filled with people that don't realize they're lost. They're church members, many of them, been attending Sunday school and church, practically all their lives. Many of them been uh, a Christian, a sprinkled, and even some baptized, but still lost sinners. And you'll never get them saved until you see, they see they're lost, and then you have some hope of getting them to God. And this man came to the end of himself. Nothing he could do, hanging on a cross. He couldn't get down. He couldn't serve God in any manner. He couldn't attend the temple. He couldn't give contributions. He couldn't be baptized. There's nothing he could do. He came to the end of the rope, so to speak, end of himself. And then he repented and believed on Jesus. And he was saved and went with the Son of God into paradise that very day. Here we see then the Saviorhood of Christ. Christ the Savior. He's the only Savior. Someone asked our guide or 
The other day, a guide in Israel was a Muslim, a good guide. He's been our guide many years over there. Well learned, man, speak five languages fluently. But he's a lost Muslim. And he, a Mohammedan is his prophet. He believed in Mohammedan. And one of the ministers asked him, said, uh, uh, Your savior, Mohammedan, said, is, uh, is he, uh, Where is he today? And he said, He's dead forevermore. And so Mohammedan died and he was buried over in Saudi Arabia. But beloved, our savior is alive. And everyone that belongs to the Mohammedan religion, uh, descendants of this uh, a false prophet, their prophet is dead. Their savior is dead. And they're still lost in their sins, groping around in spiritual blindness. And here we see the saviorhood of Christ. Christianity is the only real live religion in the world today. All other religions you'll find to be dead, spiritually dead. But Christianity, the real kind, is alive. And here we see the destination of the saved at death. Jesus said, today shall thou be with me in paradise. Now it's kind of hard for the Seventh-day Adventists, kind of hard for the Russellites to be able to handle that because they believe in soul sleeping. They believe when a person dies, he doesn't know anything to the resurrection. Of course, they deny the word of God. They're a cult, they're lost, they're blinded. But the Bible said, today shall thou be with me in paradise. He didn't say in the resurrection. He didn't say at the end of the age. He said, today. And I'm glad to report to you on the authority of the word of God. The very moment that you die, you leave your body, you go into heaven. Into the paradise of God. And very much alive there until the resurrection of that body. You live there in a soulless body with God's people, with the Lord in paradise until God gets through and ends up the church age and resurrects the bodies and so forth. And said, today shall thou be with me in paradise. Each one of you that have a loved one that died in the faith, you know where they are? They're not in the grave, only the bodies out there. They're in paradise with God, rejoicing in the presence of the Lord. And associate with friends and relatives gone on before. There they remain until the resurrection. Number three, we find the word of affection. In John chapter 19, verses 25 and 26, the Bible said, There stood by the cross of Jesus his mother. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his, unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. Now Jesus here is talking to John. And Jesus is very much concerned about the woman that placed him on the earth. He's telling John, he said, John, I want you to take care of Mary. I want you to see that she has a home, a place to dwell. Evidently, Joseph had died before this time and Mary had nowhere to live. And so Jesus asked John, the disciple he loved, to take care of her. And tradition tells us that John did exactly that. John was the last of the apostles to die, and he uh, saw that Mary had a home, a place to stay until uh, uh, her dying day. Now, Mary gave birth to the Son of God, and she's blessed among women, not above women. We have those today that's living in idolatry that pray to Mary, that uh, exalt her above women, and they made an idol out of her, and God hates it. That's rotten. It stinks to high heaven. That's no reflection on her. But reflection is on the poor, blinded, paganistic, religious people that make so much over the virgin, Mary. And then not too much about Jesus. It's pathetic. And he said to John, he said, now behold thy mother. Here we see the fulfillment of Simeon's prophecy. Where Simeon said in Luke chapter, chapter 22, or chapter 2, rather verses 34 and 35. Yea, a sword shall pierce through my own, thy own soul also. Speaking here through prophecy, how that Mary's soul would be pierced with a sword, that is, she would grieve very much because she would see her son, the Son of God, dying on a cruel Roman cross. Here we see the perfect man setting example for children to honor their parents. One of the last words of Jesus on the cross 
is he honored the woman that brought him into the world. All through the Bible, the Bible commands you to honor your parents. You cannot get around that. You cannot explain that away. You're obligated to honor your parents. I honored my mother and daddy as long as they were on the earth. I never talked back as I to my parents. I honored them. I respected them as long as they lived. My parents never heard me out taking God's name in vain when I was a sinner. I respected my mother and daddy as long as they lived. I honored them, and I'm so glad that I did. The Bible said to honor your parents, Amen. and God holds you responsible for that. You young people, you should never talk back to or size your parents, uh, grieve their hearts in that respect. You should never do that. That's wrong. That's deadly wrong. God said not do it. God holds you responsible. You're to honor your parents. And here we see then the perfect man sitting for us a good example that children should honor their parents. Here we see John had returned to the Savior's side. The Bible said all the disciples left him and fled there at the crucifixion, but John came back. And he was standing there at the cross. Jesus loved John. He was the youngest of the disciples. He's the one that lay his head up on the bosom of the Son of God. And he was close to Jesus, and God honored him, and he returned back by his side. Then we come to word number four, and that's the word of anguish. In Matthew chapter 27 and verse 46, the Bible said about the ninth hour, that's three o'clock in the afternoon, of course, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, said, Eli, Eli, lemma sabathani. That is to say, my God. My God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now you might not be able to understand the meaning of this. You must remember that Jesus was made a sin offering. He who knew no sin was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And God cannot look on sin. And when God placed the sin on Jesus Christ, he became the sin offering for all the sins of the world from Adam to the end. Then God turned his back upon Jesus, and Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he died alone. And so you need to realize that. Here we see the office of sin and the character of its wages. The wages of sin is death, and Jesus paid that sin debt for you and me. He never committed a sin, never did anything wrong. And yet all the sins of the world was placed upon him when he was made a sin offering. In the Old Testament, they'd take a little lamb. The priest would place his hands on his head and they'd kill the little lamb, take his blood and put it on the altar in the Holy of Holies. And God would look over their sins for a year. And when Jesus hung on the cross, he was that sin offering. God placed all the sins of the whole world from the beginning to the end. On the Son of God. All of them. And there he paid the sin debt. That sinners wouldn't have to go to hell. And pay for their own sins in hell. Jesus paid that sin debt. Now you can accept that payment. Or you can die and go to hell. And be tormented forever. It's left up to you as a sinner. But when you accept Jesus Christ. You accept it already paid in full. Your sin debt. And you won't have to pay that anymore. God paid for that on Calvary. Here we see the wholeness and justice of God. God is just. And God's providing a way whereby the sinners can be saved, can go to heaven when they die. Here we see the explanation of Gethsemane. That terrible word of anguish. Gethsemane means a crushed, a ground, a, a mashed. We visited the Garden of Gethsemane. It used to be an old wine press there where they would press the wine out of the grapes. And the Garden of Gethsemane today is a beautiful garden. It has some... Uh, olive trees there more than 2,000 years old. Some of the very same olive trees under which Jesus prayed, they're still there today. Over 2,000 years old and real beautiful. We visited that area again. It's so beautiful. Here we see the Savior's fidelity to God. He's in anguish. He's suffering. He says, not my will, Father, but thine be done. Here we see the real basis of our salvation. Now, salvation costs something. Here we have the basis, the price, and it costs the Savior his life on the cross and his shed blood. Here we see Christ's love for us. 
The Bible said that he so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, and then great love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Here we have in the word of anguish, the love of Jesus Christ manifested. Number five, we see the word of suffering. In John chapter 19 and verse 28, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. The Son of God had lost much blood. He had been whipped, beaten, and there, uh, part of the way to the cross, had, he had carried his cross. And so we find he had suffered tremendously. He suffered as a nail the nails through his hands. He suffered as a nail the spike through his feet. He suffered as they put the crown of thorns on his head. He suffered as they stuck the spear in his side. The Son of God suffered. And here we have the word of suffering. He said, I thirst. When you lose a lot of blood, you become very thirsty. And he had lost a lot of blood and he was very thirsty. And he said, I thirst. The word of suffering. Why did Jesus thirst? That you and I might live forever where the water of life flows in another world. Here we see the intensity of Christ's suffering. It's terrible to be wounded or dying and need water and, and so thirsty until you can hardly stand it. That's what happened to Jesus. Here we see the expression of a universal need. That's a need of this world today. That's a need of all sinners today. They need this water of life. And John chapter 4 tells us about that water of life. And every sinner today is without that water. He's thirsty. He needs that water. You ought to praise God. You should praise God that you have the water of life in your heart. Then we come to word number seven. That's the word of victory. And John chapter 19 and verse 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. I want you to note something today. In regard to the gospels from the cradle to the cross, you'll find the first spoken words of Jesus in the Gospels. He said, wish it not that I must be about my father's business. And then the very last words that Jesus spoke in the Gospels between the cradle and the cross was, it is finished. He was to be about his father's business, he said in the temple at the age of 12. On the cross, he said, it's all finished. It's finished. Jesus came on a mission, and that mission was to finish the work of his Father. He said, my work is to do the work of him that sent me. I have a job to do, and that he did. He said, it is finished. Here we see the fulfillment of all scripture concerning his death. In the Old Testament, you find many, many prophecies pertaining to the death of Jesus. You have it fulfilled here. You may say, preacher, what can you find in the Old Testament? Some of the prophecies about his future death. You find it in Psalms chapter 22. You find it in Isaiah chapter 53. You find it in other places in the Bible. Here we see the completion of his suffering. He had suffered on the earth. He said, the foxes have holes. The birds there have nests. The son of man has no place to lay his head. Now his suffering had come to an end. I may be speaking to someone today. You wonder why that you suffer on the earth. You wonder why certain things happen to you. You wonder why that you had to give up one of your loved ones. You must remember that God never makes a mistake. And our lot is a lot of suffering and grief on this earth as we sojourn. God never promised us we wouldn't suffer. God never promised us we'd never grieve. All that's included in the pilgrim journey. But here we see the completion of his suffering. Here we see the accomplishment of, of, of atonement. He accomplished our atonement. That is, he atoned for our sin. He made an atonement with his precious blood. And that atonement means to buy, to purchase, to cover up. And he covered up, he bought, he purchased. He paid all the sin debt there on Calvary. Here we see the end of our sins. They all ended right upon Jesus. Every sin you ever committed... From the time you came into this world and until you die, they all fell on Jesus. And he paid for every one of them. But if you're a lost sinner, although your sin's been paid for, if you don't accept that it's being paid for, then you'll have to pay for it in hell. 
You'll have to suffer in hell, but you won't accomplish anything by doing it. It's because you rejected what God did for you on Calvary. Here we see the end of our sins. Here we see the fulfillment of the law's requirement. The law said the soul that sinneth it shall die. And here Jesus died for you and died for me because we were all sinners, the Bible tells us. Here we see the destruction of Satan's power. The devil tried to away in the world to stop Jesus before he got to the cross. But when Jesus died on the cross, he bruised the head of the serpent. The serpent bruised his heel, but he bruised the head of the serpent and broke the power of Satan. And now the power of Satan shall not have dominion over you. That power has been broken. Then we come to word number seven, the final word, and that's the word of contentment. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 46, when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now he's contented. The job is done. It's finished. He's paid the sin debt. Here we see the Savior back again in communion with the Father. Back where he left to come to the earth, he goes back in communion now with the Father. Here we see the place of security, where he's now secure, where we all secure him. Here we see the heart's true haven. That's with Jesus Christ and God the Father on the other side. You're safe and secure in the hands of the Lord. Many years ago, there was a young man who was born without any ears. Had no ears. He could hear but he had no outside ears. And so he started school as a child and, and became accustomed to people seeing him without ears. Didn't bother him too much. He finished elementary school, went in and finished high school. Time came for him to go to college and his parents had provided for him to go to college. And they said, son, you finished high school now. We want you to enter into college and get your college education. He said, I can't do it, mama. Can't do it, daddy. They said, why, son? He said, I... He said, I can take it here at home where everybody knows me and uh, stop staring at me. But said, when I go away to college and no ears, said, people see me, they're staring at me, and I just can't take it, I just can't take it. And so he was grieved. And then his mother and daddy began to inquire around about some way to see if they couldn't correct that situation. And there's a doctor, a German doctor that had come over from Germany and New York, and they heard about how this doctor could take ears and put on the side of the man's head or a young a child's head and, and they'd look unnatural. So mother and daddy went up to pay the doctor a visit in the city of New York. He said, yes, I can take care of that, but I've got to have some human ears. Somebody will have to donate the ears. And so they sent the boy up there and sure enough, they performed surgery. They put the ears on his head. The only way you could ever notice would be a little tiny scar around the back of him. Unless you knew about it, you would never notice it. He went to the hospital, came back home. They healed over very well, looked good. And he went away to college. Came a great athlete in college. And enjoying uh, his uh, college career. And his mother took seriously ill. And they sent for him to come home. And so he went back home. He, College is quite a distance from his home. And on, by the time he got back home, his mother had passed away. When he came back home, Dad said, Son, your mother's left her. She's gone on to be with the Lord. Sorry to have to tell you about it. But said she went on in the eternity. It broke his heart, and they went into the coffin to see his mother's body, to take a look at it, went to the coffin. There they looked at his mother, and he noticed his mother had grown long hair. And he couldn't understand why. Mama never wore her hair in that manner before. And Daddy said, Son, I want to show you something that you never knew. And he reached and pulled back the hair from the side of her face, and his mother had no ears. Now what had happened, she had gone to New York, donated her own ears to her son. And there the doctor took them from her head and put them on the head of her son, and he never knew it. She let her hair grow out, cover the side of her face, and he never knew that his mother had given her ears that he might have some that he could go to college like other boys and not have to worry about people pointing at him and staring at him. And he began to weep. He said, Mom, I never knew. I knew you loved me, but I never knew that you gave your ears that I might have them. God bless you, Mama. I'll meet you in heaven someday and thank you in person. 
That's what Jesus did for us on Calvary. He paid that sin debt. He was whipped. He was beaten. He was scarred and humiliated. And there he shed God's blood and atoned for our sins. But you know, there's a day coming when we can stand yonder and bow down before him and say, Jesus, we want to thank you for what you did for us. Paid our sin debt, saved our souls, and thank you for it. And made us a home in heaven where we can live forever. Thank God for Jesus and thank God for the seven sins on the cross. I hope God will use them today to touch your hearts. Let us all stand to our feet. Our Father, I pray today that you'll take the message and use it to your glory. May your name be honored. May Jesus be glorified. Thank you, Father, that Jesus died on that cross. He paid that sin debt. We might have eternal redemption through his precious, precious shed blood. Lord, save somebody today out in the radio listen audience. Lord, maybe somebody lost in this auditorium needs thee. I pray that you speak to hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Debbie's going to play for us as she plays on the organ. If you're here in this building and you want to get saved, you want to come back to God, you want to join this church, you want to come to this altar for any reason, the way is open. It's your opportune time to come. Would you come while we wait? How about it? Is God speaking to your heart? Do you need the Lord today? You need to come back to God? Do you need a church home? Do you have a need that need to be met here at the altar? Would you come? I will wait.